All right, while we wait for the projector to come on, I'm going to recite the poem for you. And the poem is from uh, the book that she mentioned, Hashtag Black Not Blonde. In this country of opportunity, home of the brave, land of the free, a problem exists and is scaring me. Times once thought to have passed have now come again. Ignorance is the fool judging people by color of skin. Hate and prejudice still infest our races. In our cities, the country, and yes, even the suburban places. Corruption directed towards minorities is the name of this game. When the minority becomes the majority, will the rules still be the same? I see the petty games that you would play with my mind. But take this as a warning. I am black, not blind. Emerging scholars and parents, how are y'all doing? Today I want to give you or share with you the speech that I never heard. And it's a speech that I never heard, and it all happened on that day. I can see it as clear as yesterday. It was a warm, actually hot, Saturday morning in Chicago, Illinois. My parents were getting ready to take me to college. We got up early that morning and we had packed in the middle of the night, which was our custom whenever we took a trip because in my neighborhood, you don't let people know you're gonna be out of town because you might come back in your house has been broken into. So early that morning, we snuck out for the two hour drive from Chicago to normal Illinois, a town in the middle of some cornfields in central Illinois. Where my parents did all the things that parents do. They took me to my dormitory that you all now refer to as residence halls. They helped me move in. They brought me all the blankets and the notebooks and everything that they thought a young college student should need. And when we had made my bed, made the trip to the grocery store so that I had snacks in the room, it was time. It was time for my parents to say goodbye. So as we went back down to the ground floor and they got back in the car, I could see a tear well up in my mother's eye because I was her baby boy. And she was taking me to the place that she had taken my older brother four years before. And after three years in that place, he came back home without a degree. And so she looked at me and she said, son, I just want you to do your best. She said, do your best and you'll be okay. And now I'm standing there trying to be cool. I don't want to cry. <laughs> And I look over at my father, and he's standing there like, okay, it's time to go. You know, let's get in the car. Let's go. <laughs> but then I, I saw that he wanted to say something, so I'm like, all right, it's time. Pops is about to say some wisdom. He's going to drop some knowledge on me. And he came back around the car, and he shook my hand. He said, son, don't you cause these people no problems. And don't you mess with no white girls. <laughs> <laughs> Now that sounds shocking to you because many of you come from communities that are integrated. But I met the first white person my own age as a 17-year-old college freshman. So in case you don't understand Chicago and the politics, Chicago happens to be the number two most racially segregated city in the United States. I'm a 50-year-old black man and there are parts of the city of Chicago that to this day I have never been into and probably will never step foot into. Because the politics of the community say, I am not allowed to step foot into. So when my mother and father got in the car, this is who they thought they were dropping off. That's me. Right before high school graduation, we have a program called Class Sing. And I'm standing out there and I cut all my friends out of the picture. And my mother's thinking she dropped her baby boy off at Illinois State. And no sooner than they got in the car, did my alter ego appear. See, in high school, I started a club called the T.S. Gents. 
Everyone in the club had a nickname that starts with a T and an S. And I'm too smooth, Romeo, can't play the gigolo, can sell ice cubes to an Eskimo. They could yell, they could say it 
nicely. They could do sign language. They could show it and print it in a pamphlet. But some of y'all think you can you too slick. You could be a TS jet. You too slick. You know how to do this. Now, you sat there and somebody after the first time said, oh, he ain't gonna make me stand up no more. <laughs> and somebody said, well, I'm already standing. I know he ain't gonna make me sit down again, so I'm just gonna keep standing. <laughs> then after about the third time, you said, I'm tired of this. <laughs> I heard somebody, when I just said, I'm gonna ask you to stand up. Well, wait a minute, this, I'm too tired. <laughs> you ain't even stood up yet. <laughs> so let me break that down for you. See, on your first day of class, you're going to get this thing called syllabus. And some of y'all are going to say, you know what? I'm too tired to go to the first day of class. <laughs> and some of y'all, the teacher going to say, if you study and you read these books and this page, and you come to my class and you sit right here and you take these notes, you will graduate. But nah, I'm too tired. You can't make me take no notes. But you think this is some kind of learning institution? <laughs> I came here for the parties. I came here for the women. I came to get away from them people that's getting on my nerve. I'm grown. Hmm. You grown and you stupid. <laughs> I'm just calling you like I see it. I don't have 20 minutes, probably 10 left now, to try to make a difference in your life. I didn't come here to make no friends. If I have to choose, and my daughter will attest to this, between being your friend and being honest, honest going to win every time. See, I, I work for a living at these institutions. Clemson was number four out of six that I've worked at. I've done everything from recruit students to teach in the classroom. I know what success looks like. I know what it takes to get out of this place, and I know the obstacles that are against you. So when I come to programs like this and I see people wasting other folks' time and their money, it really pisses me off. So I don't know if somebody else has told you, but what you're going through is the same thing other people went through. And believe it or not, they had it a little harder than you. Go back and read the history of this institution and others like it so that you understand what happened to enable you to be able to sit in this room. But I digress. Let me move forward with my message. Because I want to share my mother's hopes and dreams. See, I talked about my older brother, so this picture is my mother, my brother, and myself. And I'm the cute one in the picture. <laughs> now, my brother's four years my senior, and like I said, he went to Illinois State University four years before I ever got there. As a matter of fact, the only reason I went there is because I went to visit him during spring break. And fortunately for me, he had some friends who were a little smarter than he was, who actually took me to classes and showed me how, in my mind, easy college was. See, I got up every morning in the city of Chicago and left my house at 5.45 a.m. to catch a bus to the L station to catch an L, to get off, to catch another bus, to get off that bus, to walk two blocks to school. There's no, there's no bus that comes and pick you up. I didn't have a car. My parents weren't going to drop me off. Not to mention the gangs. I crossed at least four different gang territories to go to high school. I went to a high school in the community that you had to take a test to go to this high school, and the people in the community generally didn't pass the test, so they didn't like us too much coming in their neighborhood. To give you an example of what type of environment I went to, anybody here play basketball? All right, so y'all have basketball trials, right? So my freshman year, we had basketball trials. Now, my mom told me to come home, so I couldn't even try out. Not to mention I was too short. Wouldn't have made the team anyway. <laughs> Next day, I get to school. All my friends are upset, and they're crying, and they're telling the story of how when they all left the gym, because you know how you get that new pair of shoes, the people in the neighborhood went shopping as they walked back to the bus stop. They took all of their gym shoes. Everybody who tried out and had a new pair of shoes went on out. So this is the environment I have, but I'm my mother's hopes and dreams because my brother went to college, spent three years there, and came back home without the piece of paper he was supposed to get. And to really make this stick, it was something that I haven't really thought about this like I got ready to come here. My brother and I represent the first generation in my mother's side of the family and my father's side of the family to not grow up picking cotton to earn money. The first generation in my family to grow up not having to pick cotton 
to earn money. This stuff about retirement, I'm trying to figure this out because there's nobody in my family retired. They didn't have a job with 401k and all these benefits. So when I come here and I see you all, I'm talking about, I know I'm my mother's hopes and dreams, but some of you all are your mothers and fathers' hopes and dreams. My parents dropped off Brian Smith, not too smooth, but it took me almost four years to figure that out. Now the good thing about too smooth is he's a master of time. He understood potential and his value. Matter of fact, too smooth might consider himself a diamond in the rough. And that's what I want to ask you. Are you a diamond in the rough? Or are you a cubic succumbent? <laughs> See, you need three things. Some coal, some time, and some pressure if you want to have a diamond. Whatever state you are in right now, I'm calling you the cold state. Parents have invested in you. Now they put a little bit of pressure on you, high schools pressure on you, even the communities in which you come from might have had some pressure on you. But it ain't nothing like the pressure this place has for you. Study for an engineering exam and you'll feel pressure. Be the only person that looks like you in a classroom and you will feel pressure. Walk across campus wondering if somebody's going to call you out of your name and you will feel pressure. Look at your roommate and wonder, is he or she really your friend and you will feel pressure. So there's things that's going to happen, but it's that pressure that you need to become a doctor. Without the pressure and without putting in the time, guess what you are? A rock. Now they don't put diamonds in the same case that they put cubic zirconias. But some of y'all got some cubic zirconia friends. <laughs> Told y'all I'd get back to that. I don't know how a group of young men here at this program go to the bathroom together and act a complete fool in the bathroom the way they did without one brother stepping up and saying, hey man, I don't think we should be doing this. See? I got this thing that corporate America has taught me, and actually it's part of my discipline, is communication. It's called the rule of 10 and the rule of 12. People will judge you the very first time they meet you on three things. The first 10 words out of your mouth, the first 10 steps you take toward them, and the, first, and the top 10 to 12 inches of your being. So it's not the first 10 words you say to them, it's the first 10 words they hear out of your mouth. I can't repeat the first 10 words I heard out of these brothers' mouths. Because the language is pretty foul. Now this program has a reputation. They don't know if I'm the only person that heard or not. They don't know what the consequences are, who's going to have to hear about it, and who might have to go home, or who can't come in next year because you acting such a fool in the bathroom. Now, my son has a Clemson degree. My daughter has another degree. My oldest son has a college degree. And I could be satisfied and be like, we got ours, get yours, deuces. But I'm saying this right here out loud because I want everybody to hear. You don't know who's watching you when they're watching you. You don't know if I have a $100,000 scholarship money in my pocket trying to decide which one of y'all or all y'all gonna get it or no. But you need to remember, you want to be a diamond or you want to be a zircon. Now, I got one more quick story. When I was in my zirconia phase, I took a chemistry class my freshman year. Now, the high school I went to was what they call tech prep, college prep. So I had chemistry, biology, and physics in high school. And I'm in this lecture hall taking basic chemistry that I already know. And I'm like, this is a joke. It's 300 people in here, the teacher don't know who I am, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, I know all this stuff, I ain't even gonna go to class. Not only am I not gonna go to class, I ain't reading this book because I already learned this stuff in high school. This is a joke, I threw the book down to me. First test, guess who got an F? Second test, guess who got an F? Third test, guess who got an F? Me. Now, the saving grace for me was, they have this thing called the Comprehensive Final Exam. You can, I failed the first three tests. How am I going to pass a Comprehensive Final Exam? Well, I failed the 
first three tests, not because I was stupid, just because I didn't go to class. I got an A on the final. I got a C out of the class. Now, I'm telling you this not so that you can say, well, he can do it. Let me figure out how to get three Fs, and I'll get an A and get a C too. <laughs> it don't work like that most places. No, I didn't go to school that time. I went somewhere else. <laughs> so I want to make sure you, maybe I should put it in perspective. Because see, part of my experience in college and why I had problems is because nobody ever gave me a true breakdown of what college was about. How many of you have ever been on an airplane? Okay. How many of you have ever been to the doctor? All right, check this out. Would you get on an airplane if you knew the pilot got a C in landing? <laughs> Would you have surgery if you knew the doctor got a D or an F in stitches? <laughs> Anesthesia. Oh, I missed that day. <laughs> See, we don't want that kind of service from people, but we often get it. There's some people in here right now that already made up their mind. I don't know what my schedule is, but all I'm going to get is a C. I just want to do the minimum. What do I need to just stick around and have some fun? I wish it was some kind of way, like when you walk around with your cell phone, your grades would just beam across your head. <laughs> so people would see. <laughs> now, it's funny, but those grades, people do see them when you start applying for jobs. And I don't think anybody's coming here so that they can just not work ever again. Most of us either going to be entrepreneurs or going to work for somebody else. And even if you own your own business, people want to see the credentials. They want to know that you know something more than that little bit that you might have known. So we got to change. The only way I graduated was because I changed. And there's a couple of ways you can deal with change. You can prepare for it, you can resist it, you can fear it, or you can be crushed by it. Most of those, fear it will get you crushed. Resisting it will probably get you crushed, but preparing for it is the best thing you can do. Now think about this. Some people are afraid to change. I don't want to go this far from home. I don't know if I can do it. I don't want to live with this person. I don't want to study that. You change your drawers every day. You change your mind every day. You're going to change cars, girlfriends, boyfriends, and others every other day. But when it comes to your regular life and your academic life, you don't want to change. You just don't be you. I'm going to keep it 100. This is how I am. I'm going to do this. The streets of South Carolina are full of people who thought that same thing. They look exactly like you. Which goes back to my first and original point. It's a system. You're here to learn the system. Learn it. Master it and then go back and fight it. If you thought it was wrong and unfair, change it. Use what they taught you to change the system. But you can't go in on your first day. You trying to get your little bachelor's degree and you gonna go tell the professor, uh, you said we were slaves. We weren't slaves, we were enslaved. This person has a PhD and they ain't trying to get it. If the book says you were a slave, memorize that, write the paper, say I was a slave, and then when you get your degree, Write your own book. Say whatever you want to say in your book, and then let people honor you and your degrees. It's not selling out. You temporarily buy in. So here I am getting my first degree. It's my bachelor's degree. And you know how your mama is sitting in the wrong section, like way, way up somewhere? <laughs> so this is why this picture looks like this. My mama's way up somewhere with a camera. It's all blurry, so that was before digital cameras, so she actually had this film development, and that's me. And when I walked across that stage, my parents were there. It was one of the proudest moments of my life. And it's interesting because when I graduated, my parents were actually on their way to visit my grandparents. So they came to graduation, like on the way to go see my grandparents. And so we stopped after that, and I just felt like they were driving off and dropping me off all over again but I was graduating. And so later, when I got my master's, my father wasn't there. He'd had a stroke. He hadn't died, but he wasn't able to travel. And I didn't understand this. I was really ticked off about the fact that he didn't come to my graduation. And I held on to that for a long time. 
And I held on to it for a couple of reasons. See, I, I got a job right out of college. And I quit that job after working two years to go to grad school, and my father didn't understand that. Why would you give up a good job to go back to school? Because he hadn't gone to school, so he didn't understand what my master's degree was going to do for me. <clears throat> so after I graduated and put my master's, it took me a little longer to get my second job. And my father actually passed away before I started working. So he never saw me get that second job. But he also never heard me say, I appreciate you. I love you. I'm sorry. There's lots of things that you're going to have to deal with as you change and go through this thing called college. And the thing that you can hope for and count on the most is that the people who are responsible for sending you here have your back. They may not agree with you and everything that you do. Matter of fact, they probably ain't gonna like it. If my mother knew half the stuff I did at college, she probably would beat me right now. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, have to, I stopped inviting her speeches because I say things and then she's like, you get what? <laughs> so I wanna make sure that you take this time to realize and recognize that your goal when you walk across that stage is to walk across that stage as close to being the authentic person that your parents brought here as you can be. If your parents believe they dropped off a black child or a Latino child, when you walk across that stage, you better be a black and a Latino graduate. If they think they brought a young man or a young woman, that's what you should walk across the stage and be. Remember, you are a reflection of the hope that they have for you. Now, I've spent my little time up, and I've hurt a few feelings, stepped on some toes, but it's only because I love you. And if nobody else tells you that today, you would not say that I walked off this stage without letting you know that somebody loves you and cares about you. I love you and care about you enough to be critical, to tell you the things that other people won't tell you, because I want to be with other diamonds and not zirconias. I appreciate y'all's time. Peace be on you. Y'all have a great song.